and they have a lot of horses. So there are two aspects to their grazing system that make it work. One is that they have a wood chip barnyard, which is basically a stabilized bowl inside a fence, all right, um, which is filled with wood chips. And those wood chips get changed out periodically, but they contain runoff, they stay dry and stable in all weathers, and they can turn out animals into this area in any weather, any time. Um, so that's one aspect, having a barnyard or a sacrifice that will be available any time. Then they have a series of paddocks with laneways that access them. Okay, so similar to that last layout. Um, and then they have a, uh, off this way, they have a large paddock for animals that they want to have time to move really a lot. Um, and let's see, I think they, they probably have another access here, something like that. So they have a lot of paddocks, they have a lot of horses. And what they do is they think of each of these as one paddock. So the occupation time in each of these paddocks is controlled and they're given rest between occupations. All right, so if they have 30 horses in the barn, they have a schedule of turnouts and they have paddocks that are numbered. And so, um, say, let's call this strip A. So they'll schedule an hour or two hours of turnout for each horse in strip A on the first week. And then they'll move that turnout to strip B on the second week, strip C on the third week, so that strip A can get up to three weeks of recovery between impacts from the horses. Um, and they, they don't turn any horses out together, as far as I know. And so it's a really complex system. And they have full-time employees at the barn. And so those people are leading horses in and out to different paddocks all day. So um, really time consuming, not necessarily something that any one of us could do on, you know, on a farm by ourselves. But if you have people and their job is to take care of horses and to move them around and exercise them, this is a way that you can do it. So, there's that. Um, let's see, what else do we talk about? Oh, reseeding is always an important thing in horse grazing. So just having the ability to cut off certain areas and put down new seed so that you don't end up with a lot of bare spots. Um, and another thing, so, as in the system at Sterling where we have as many of the different types of livestock in one group as we can, I think looking at social groups for turning out horses is something that can yield a lot of returns. So for example, in the East Hill system, if you knew that you could turn out six horses together, it's gonna save you a whole lot of time versus turning out one horse at a time. And so I think working out effective ways to introduce horses to one another and to manage um, their interactions. Because generally speaking, going back to that slide of the two horses fighting, horses don't want to fight. Most organisms don't want to fight. It's not a good evolutionary tactic. You tend to get hurt and then you get sick and die. So um, it's generally animals will go through a lot of posturing and gesturing and then they'll get over it. And that posturing can be really dramatic, but if you can work through it with horses, then um, you can start to see ways to put those groups together and to have um, a much, much better um, <laughs> rotation uh, with less, less impact and more rest time. Um, and then, I guess, I think we've talked about this a bit, but the practical considerations of how you get to your animals 
and when is something to put a lot of thought into. So we tend to, we cut hay with our horses. This is my younger son with Belle and Wren, who are our main team. They're 15 year old mares and we mowed about 35 acres of hay with them last summer. Um, and so they need to be accessible. Nighttime grazing is a great way to manage horses so that they go out to a paddock when you're not using them and when there aren't as many flies and then they come in and uh, get ready to go to work. Um, and that is going to apply whether you have a horse you use for leisure or one that you use for work. And I think um, you can, so I always put ecology as sort of my primary consideration. My husband always puts work as his primary considerations. It kind of balances out. But um, if you forget this, you can end up with a horse that's grazing really effectively that never gets used. And that's not going to benefit anyone. So that's, that's a good thing to think about. And I think we talked about fences. Any questions or comments? <laughs> That's Leroy. I was on my way to work. <laughs> yeah, I was busy. And uh, yeah, I thought someone was driving a truck across our field at first. And then all of the horses came like trotting down with this <laughs> round bale feeder attached to Leroy. So he, he, he did, he was, he calmed down quickly. He just was like, what? What do I do? But anyway, yeah. Um, are there any particular forages that you would look to seed, like specifically to make horses happy kind of thing? I, the only reason I think I would seed for horses would be because they had destroyed what was there. <laughs> um, and so if I'm looking for a seed to put down with horses. There are th three main things. Um, it's got to be resilient to traffic. Um, you want it to be somewhat productive and not too high sugar. And then you want, um, what was the third thing? No, I don't remember the third thing. But um, the things that I would recommend are bluegrass, creeping red fescue and white clover basically because they can withstand a lot of hoof traffic and they can um, they spread instead of clumping as grasses. Um, the other thing with seeding that I always tell people is what grows in your pasture is more a product of your management than it is a product of what you put out there for seed. And so it's good to look and see what's there in a management system before you spend money on seed. And also, if you are going to seed, you really want to get your fertility right first. Because, for example, if you're going to put down legumes, but you don't have enough calcium and your pH is wrong, you're not going to get legume growth. And so you don't want to spend the money before you get the fertility right. So if you want to improve your pasture, management and fertility come first, seeding is secondary. Anything else? Anyone have specific sort of systems that they have that they'd like to? Mm -hmm. Yes. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Yeah. I would say turn your sheep out first. Have a space where you can put your horses. It's really hard. Like, our horses are like, hey, I don't think so in the spring. They just, they don't want to eat it. But if you can get them to fill up on hay before you put them out, that can be helpful. So if you put them in overnight, for example, and give them plenty of low quality hay, then they're going to be fuller when they go out and less likely to pig out. 
Um, and then just, I introduce them slowly, you know, like two hours out, back in, four hours out, back in. <laughs> so, yeah. The other thing that we've done, so um, Leroy here is a two-year-old, and this is his mom, Ren. And she, when she was nursing, had much higher nutritional needs. So sometimes we'd separate out those two and graze them with the cows and then put the others behind. So you can mix up groups if they're good to each other. <laughs> so you yeah, there are, s yeah. Generally it is safe and not so much for your woods, but generally okay for your horses. Um, there are, th the one thing that um, can be a consideration is red maple um, because it's toxic in fairly low amounts. Like I think something like two pounds of leaves can be deadly. And when it's most toxic is when it's wilted. So if you cut something down, if it falls down or if the horses kill it, and then the leaves wilt. Um, those are things to watch for, but. <laughs> I think it's actually fairly sweet. Yeah, so it's definitely something to watch. It's actually the one, one of two livestock poisonings that I've heard of in Vermont as a downed red maple. Um, windstorms. Think about windstorms. I had a cow almost kill herself on apples after a windstorm. There were no apples on the ground when they went in there, and then it was windy overnight, and in the morning she was really sick. So, yeah, windstorms. Oh, yeah? Huh. Wow. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, so there are plant toxicities out there, and they tend to crop up like that. Like, I didn't know that was going to happen, but yes. Um, I just wanted to mention um, one thing that I shared at our farm where we had some grass horses mm -hmm. was that tall overgrowth that had gotten away from us because of the wet um, spring. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't, um, we actually threw the horses in before we paid. And oh, interesting. You know, in, in our ecological management, it was fine that they trampled some, yep. and they ate some, mm -hmm. and they didn't send any high nutrient ahead of them. Mm -hmm. We paid after them, and they really helped um, cut the swath down mm -hmm. so that there wasn't as much toll on our mowers yep. and equipment. Yep. We were really happy with that. Yeah. And we sent them through in the large strips, like what you mm -hmm. do. Um, like long. Yeah, big, long spaces mm -hmm. for them. Right. Yeah. Yep. Um, or high nutritional needs. Mm -hmm. The low before hay. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. Yeah. So were you haying with horses? Um, no. No. But I can see how that could, <laughs> it could help if, you know, if you had a really dense swath and you're trying to get through it with a mower, it might be helpful. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Great. All right. I have no idea what time it is, but. I think that's what I have. So, thank you. Confirmed that it's a pipe dream for me. Oh my god.